Every battle is shaped by the terrain on which it is fought. Naval battles do not take place in the middle of the Sahara, and nor do tank battles take place in the middle of the Pacific. A war fought in the jungle will be fundamentally different than a war fought hopping between islands, which in turn will never resemble a war fought in the countryside or in the heart of a major city. If a military can be prepared for the demands of a battle in a specific kind of location, then it will be well suited to win. If a military is unprepared for that location, then it's likely to be punished ruthlessly by enemy forces. And in all the world, there are few sorts of terrain more demanding, more fundamentally impassable than the mountains. In battles and wars waged on steep, rough terrain at high altitudes and bitterly low temperatures, a fighting force that's not ready for the mountains is likely to be consumed by them. And if a fighting force can use the mountains to their advantage, learn not just to survive but thrive there, then they can become untouchable against enemies still stuck in the lowlands. On today's installment of our Art of War series, we're going to be digging into the realm of mountain warfare, how it works in theory, and some of the many real-world conflicts that have been decided at high altitude. So mountain warfare, also referred to as alpine warfare, has been a part of history for as long as large-scale wars have been fought. Even in peacetime, mountains have strategic significance to a nation or a tribe. Often, they form convenient natural borders, hard to traverse en masse, even without an enemy force taking potshots. At other times, and sometimes simultaneously, uh, they also form the origin point of rivers and streams that provide a critical water supply to a dry lowland area. On the other hand, mountains are historically shown to be among the easier places for indigenous communities and tribes to retain a level of autonomy, especially when those mountains are remote and have only minimal ties to a ruling government hundreds of kilometers away. In wartime, all of these factors converge to make mountain terrain critically important. They can be a tough but necessary gateway for some invading forces or a crucial tool to dictate when and where a military will have to protect its homeland. They can be a high priority target for capture or a point of retreat when the lowlands have been lost. They can be a home to insurgents, revolutionaries, and dissidents, or they can be the area to which an unprepared enemy is shepherded against their will, stranded on barren summits, and left to waste away. A simple place to start when understanding how mountain warfare plays out is to understand the basic importance of holding high grounds. Much like Obi Wan Kenobi getting ready to ice a mother. Armies that can situate themselves on high ground have a number of advantages that play to their favor. They have a far wider field of view. They're slower to tire while fighting downhill than an enemy fighting uphill. They can throw or fire projectiles for longer distances. And in the world of modern mechanized warfare, they force an enemy to abandon any heavy equipment that can't handle steep or uneven slopes. Both historical cannons and modern-day tanks often struggle to fire upward, and even in historical melee combat, it's a hell of a lot easier to wave a spear around at your own hip height than it is to hold it above your head for hours. And then there's the physical risks posed by high altitude. Although humans can usually maintain good health at altitudes up to 8,000 feet above sea level, above that zone, decreased oxygen in the air can lead to a whole range of problems. Even just at 4,000 feet above sea level, people can start to begin to experience so-called mountain sickness, a mild form of altitude sickness that involves head and muscle aches, shortness of breath, dizziness, and nausea, which can often take multiple days to recuperate from upon returning to lower altitudes. More severe altitude sickness includes conditions like hypoxia, low oxygen in the body tissues, causing confusion, difficulty breathing, and rapid heart rate, and decompression sickness, nitrogen dissolving in a person's blood and forming bubbles, which can be an incredibly painful condition. People who live in the mountains, or train to acclimate to high altitudes can overcome these conditions. But if an attacking force fails to engage in that sort of preparation, they'll find their own bodies turning against them even before they enter combat. And acclimating is a process that involves zero shortcuts. There is no way for a person to make the process go faster. In context to warfare, this means a lowland army pushed into the mountains too fast will experience the effects of altitude sickness, and if they do take the time to acclimate, they'll have to spend days in camp surrounded by higher mountains on all sides as sitting ducks for as long as it takes to get ready to keep moving on. Just as important as the altitude is the bitter cold that one may find while trying to traverse the mountains. On the human body, cold can have a range of nasty effects, frostbite, hypothermia, even trench foot, all of which can impact under-equipped or poorly dressed soldiers nearly immediately. Even soldiers who are ready for the cold can be worn down physically and psychologically by it. And that situation only gets worse when we factor in the altitude sickness that we just talked about. In cold weather, weapons are more prone to jamming, vehicles and generators require more fuel to operate, and even water and basic 
basic supplies will be frozen unless precautions are taken. And each of these problems only get worse when we factor in wind chill. For reference, the Mount Washington Observatory, which long held the record for the most extreme surface wind speed on Earth, sees a year-round average wind speed of almost 57 kilometers an hour. Again, these are all problems that a well-trained and well-prepared alpine fighting force can take care of, but they tend to be intensely challenging for a force that isn't 110% ready. And expanding on the idea of readiness, it's important to point out just how difficult it is to get a soldier ready to endure mounting environments for long periods of time. War in the mountains requires extreme physical fitness, as well as mental readiness and ability to endure the elements. They also need to be trained in fighting in small units, often at the platoon or even the squad level. For reference, a US Army rifle platoon is 42 soldiers, whereas a rifle squad is made up of just nine soldiers. These soldiers need to be ready to fight and live in a decentralized way, and equipped with skills in climbing, repelling, and wilderness survival. They've also got to contend with the reality that medical support, evacuation, and logistical resupply are unlikely, meaning that they must learn to operate basically on their own. Mountain warfare also has a profound effect on the way that intelligence and reconnaissance works. Maps are often severely lacking in detail or just flat out wrong, and since every little valley is obstructed by hills, they will typically need to be scouted one by one if they are to be understood. What looks like a dry, easy route at one time of year might be blanketed in feet of snow a few months later, and a few months after that it might be a raging river that there's simply no way to traverse. In an era of aerial warfare, difficult weather often makes it hard to get real-time information on what's happening in this sort of terrain, and before planes became available for aerial reconnaissance, militaries were constrained fully by what they could do with small teams of scouts who could be gone for weeks or even months at a time before returning. And that's only if those scouts were able to avoid enemy forces who were also operating in the same mountain ranges. And lastly, we've got to give a bit closer attention to the mountains as a center for insurgents and resistant movements. As we'll explore in a moment, there are no shortage of historical examples here, but even just in theory, mountain terrain is a vital asset for rebel forces and militias looking to establish a stronghold. In his book Guerrilla Warfare, the Marxist revolutionary Che Guevara explained, fighting on favorable grounds, and particularly in the mountains, presents many advantages. He points out, that mountains force an enemy to operate cautiously while allowing revolutionaries to dig into defensive positions, shelter non-combatants, and even run training camps. Because mountains force militaries to leave a lot of their heavy equipment behind or risk bringing it through narrow passes and notches, they expose those militaries to ambush and level the playing field with insurgencies that are often equipped only with small arms. Mountains are very difficult to surveil with small reconnaissance teams, especially when the militias that control the mountains are more than able to patrol and sniff them out. And it's important not to miss the simple realities of fatigue. A conventional military, forced to scale mountains without their transport vehicles, are likely to be exhausted and disorganized by the time they enter battle, where, again, a mountain insurgency has already built traps and ambushes that are just waiting for them. Now, would it be fair to call the Second Punic War, fought between Rome and Carthage from 208 to 201 BCE, the first use of mountain warfare tactics in a major war? After all, war in the mountains has probably been around for as long as there's been people living in the mountains. But the Second Punic War does provide a great first case study because of how the armies of Carthage, led by their commander Hannibal, was able to turn Rome's natural mountain defenses into a liability. See, Rome at this time was still mostly constrained to the Italian peninsula, protected in the north by a mountain range, the Alps. They considered the Alps to provide a naturally impassable border against attack, and historically that assumption has been correct. But when Hannibal was able to bring his armies across the Alps and all of a sudden show up in northern Italy, it set the stage for a 15-year rampage that would inflict over a million Roman casualties. As the historians of the day told the story, Hannibal was unopposed by the Romans while attempting to scale the Alps, but they got their fair share of fighting anyway, harassed by mountain tribes in the Rhone Valley in what is known today as southern France. Getting up the mountains was a brutal slog for Hannibal's forces. He lost many to raids and the natural perils of climbing, and even had to divert course in order to avoid massing armies of Gaelic warriors who meant to challenge them. But after they passed through the high notches in the mountain range, their problems actually only got worse. The Italian side of the Alps was far steeper and more difficult to navigate, and Hannibal's armies had to descend not just with themselves, but their supply trains, their pack animals, their cavalry horses, and even a group of war elephants. Ancient historians recall that Hannibal's men, as well as his animals, suffered from malnutrition and despair during the crossing, although they were eventually able to get off the Alps and into Italy itself. 
The Alps would be the most dangerous enemy Hannibal would face for more than a decade, until his forces were finally defeated in North Africa. The next historical example takes us to China about the four centuries after Hannibal's crossing in the Battle of Jieting in 228 CE. The battle was fought as a part of China's Three Kingdoms period, specifically between the kingdoms of Cao Wei and Shu Han. Jieting, a strategically important region of China, was a mountainous area, and the general leading the Shu Han Kingdom's armies, a strategist named Ma Su, decided to claim the high ground in order to give himself an advantage. But in doing so, Ma Su had declined to listen to instructions from his superiors in favor of following the general advice contained in the books of military strategy. He found out the hard way that holding the mountains is not always an advantage. Rather than the Kaowe armies challenging Ma Su on the hillsides, they simply encircled and besieged the mountain, where there was nowhere near enough water and supplies to hold out for very long. The situation was so bad that Ma Su is said to have fled the battle, sneaking off the mountain and leaving his forces without a commander. He would later be executed for his actions, while on the mountaintop, his lieutenant would take command and manage to orchestrate a breakout, followed, of course, by a very hasty retreat back towards safety. Now, of course, we can't go talking about mountains in war without talking about the Scottish Highlands, where offensive tactics like the Highland Charge gave Scots forces a chance of victory against overwhelming odds. The tactic is simple. Fire down at an enemy from the high hills using muskets, then throw the muskets to the ground, draw broadswords, and get to work up close and personal, where an army equipped with literal swords is going to be more than able to deal with a posh group of musket and bayonet-wielding invaders. The Highland Charge underwent a series of evolutions in the 1600s and 1700s, but the basic idea remained the same, and is a good reference point for a wide range of melee tactics taking advantage of a downhill charge. Now, if there's any place on Earth that really should be known for its mountains, and thus its mountain warfare, that would be Nepal, which was unified out of a number of independent kingdoms scattered throughout the Himalayas. The unification was spearheaded by Prithvi Naranyan Shah, king of the Orca Kingdom, who expanded outward and annexed the territory across modern-day Nepal. We've actually done a separate war graphics piece all about his fearsome warriors, the Gurkhas, so do check that out if you'd like to go in-depth on that topic, but suffice to say that the Gurkhas, both then and now, are some of the fiercest mountain fighters in the world. With bodies well adapted to extremely high altitudes, the Gurkhas were able to fluently navigate across the Himalayas, sending raiding parties or even entire armies through territory that gave them major tactical advantages, especially when operating in large numbers. By navigating on and between the mountains, Gurkha forces were able to descend again and again on the forts and cities nestled into the Himalayan valleys, eventually taking control of the entire region. Their tactics were clear. Blockade a valley, close off its trade routes, and eventually starve the valley until it would either submit or lack the strength to oppose the Gurkhas in force. And it was just over a year after Nepal settled into its current borders that in 1817 Latin America submitted a bold entry to the history of mountain warfare. The crossing of the Andes, performed by South American pro-independence forces under the command of Jose de San Martin. By this time, Argentina had already secured its independence, but its long, skinny western neighbor Chile was struggling to force its way out from Spanish control. Separated by the Andes Mountains, another range that is historically difficult to traverse, Spanish royalists didn't expect that the Chilean independence movement would be getting much support from Spain, but Jose de San Martin and his forces were able to change that. In the span of a few weeks, San Martin's army of the Andes crossed over 300 miles, 480 kilometers of steep mountain trails, including at altitudes well over 4,000, even as high as 5,000 meters. At the end of the crossing, about 3,000 Andean fighters were able to badly outnumber Spanish forces, driving down from the mountains and eventually liberating Chile. And as we draw close to the modern day, we check in, as always, with the Second World War, where oh, one of the best examples of mountain warfare comes from the Eastern Front. 1942 to 1944 marked the initial thundering cascade, the slow, grinding war, and the eventual breakdown of Hitler's great advance into the Soviet Union, and in particular the Caucasus Mountains. These areas are home to a lot of groups that make mountain warfare their bread and butter. The people of modern-day Chechnya, Dagestan, Ingushetia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and more. In order to attack these areas, Nazi Germany leveraged several dedicated mountain divisions stacked full of troops hailing from the mountainous regions of Europe. However, Soviet troops, especially loyal forces defending their home mountains, were able to delay the German advance long enough for their front lines elsewhere to collapse. Elsewhere, Germany was able to overrun the Balkans in a matter of weeks, but Yugoslav and Greek partisans took advantage of their mountainous home region in order to launch a guerrilla war. While Nazi Germany had extremely capable mountain troops, the partisans of this area and elsewhere in the war were able to effectively use hit-and-run tactics and rely on their mobility to run circles around larger, slower Nazi forces.
So, as we move into the present, there's one example in particular that straddles both the later 20th century and the first part of the 21st. Afghanistan, better known among military historians as the place where empires go to die. Afghanistan is an extremely hilly and mountainous region, sparsely populated, and it also features a rather massive network of caves. From 1979 to 1989, the Soviet Union learned a hard lesson while trying to invade Afghanistan. The weather will kill you. The slopes and cliffs will kill you. Trying to operate heavy machinery will kill you. Not wearing your socks will kill you. Walking upright while firing your weapon will kill you. Leaving a piece of trash behind from last night's camp will kill you. The Mujahideen is trying to kill you, and if they fail, the mountains get to take their turn, and the mountains rarely miss. American forces, despite learning from some of the Soviets' examples, were constantly under attack from roving bands of militia fighters who could run circles around their camps and convoys, planting IEDs and launching surprise attacks before they melted away into the landscape. In these high mountains, Afghan militias have long been at an advantage, more than capable of navigating the terrain there without suffering physical effects, while armies making their first foray into Afghanistan Afghanistan must spend weeks or even months acclimating before they're ready to fight. Afghan militias are organized in a way where they can comfortably travel light, navigate harsh terrain, and run a guerrilla insurgency using fallback points and resource depots, while on the opposing side, both the Soviets and the Americans have learned the hard way that every surrounding hill or mountain is a potential vector for attack in a land where they are always seen coming. Finally, the mountains of Afghanistan have a nasty habit of being an Achilles heel for technology-dependent militaries who find themselves digging up century-old volumes on how to properly train mules and other pack animals, while the privates out back figure out which warehouses the tanks will be sent off to so they can start collecting dust. Mountain warfare has also shown up in Libya, particularly the Nafusa mountain range in the northwestern corner of the country. During both of Libya's civil wars in the 21st century, the Nafusa mountains have been controlled mostly by the militias operating out of the nearby city of Zindan, a formidable fighting force with no real competitors in the area who could challenge their authority. During the country's first civil war in 2011, the militias in the mountains used heavy pickup trucks and even monster trucks that could navigate the terrain of these desert peaks. Despite being surrounded during the conflict by Muammar Gaddafi's government forces, the local militias were able to use the mountains as a nigh-on impenetrable home base, holding out despite a lack of ammunition and even conducting counter-raids on government weapon stores. After months of battles across the mountain range, the local rebels were able to win out over government forces, making the mountains into a resistant stronghold and eventually using them as a home base to launch a decisive advance westward into government territory. And lastly, we've got to talk about the Kurds, an ethnic group tens of millions strong who lay claim to the mountains that intersect between Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. For decades, Kurdish forces have fought battles with each of those nations, and in the last decade, they briefly became instrumental allies of the West as ground troops fighting the Islamic State. During the years of Saddam Hussein's Iraq, Kurdish-held mountains were considered off-limits by the regime due to how significant the Kurdish military advantage in those areas was. And though Turkey has long attempted to stamp out Kurdish paramilitary forces, they have been generally unable to establish any real control over Kurdish territory. In their operations against the Islamic State, the Kurds used their mountain territory to beat back attacks and stage counter-offensive operations into the Syrian and Iraqi lowlands, especially against the city of Mosul, where Kurds performed surveillance from nearby mountains for the years that the city was under Islamic State control. During this time, Kurds were able to secure their own mountains and eradicate the Islamic State from others, including Sinjar Mountain, where in 2014, Iraqi Kurds staged a daring assault to break an Islamic State siege against the minority Yazidi population in the area. After being encircled on Sinjar Mountain and starved out for months, Yazidi civilians were rescued by a large Kurdish militia who punched a hole through Islamic State forces and eventually cleared them from the mountain entirely. Since the days of their counterinsurgency against the Islamic State, Kurdish forces have been able to reach a mostly peaceful equilibrium with Syria and Iraq, even as they find themselves under escalating threat from Turkey. These days, Kurdish forces in the mountains are increasingly being targeted by Turkish drones, which somewhat reduce the mountains' relevance in keeping Turkish militias and even civilians safe from retaliation. But nonetheless, the mountains remain a massive strategic asset for Kurdish forces, without which they would probably face far worse odds in trying to resist Turkey. In the modern world, most militaries that either protect mountains on their sovereign soil or have a reasonable expectation of fighting in mountains elsewhere or will invest in maintaining robust mountain warfare capabilities in case they're needed. The major Andean nations of Argentina and Chile each operate numerous mountain units, as do the Alpine nations of Switzerland and Italy, whose ski troops are the stuff of Alpine warfare legend around the world. China, India, and Pakistan each maintain units to watch over their sections of the Himalayas, and Colombia's high mountain battalions 
Marines have become some of the most experienced mountain warfare operators in the world. The United States operates its Army Mountain Warfare School in the mountains of the state of Vermont, and its main core mountain warfare training center operates in the mountains near Yosemite National Park. Russia, seizing on its wealth of recruits from the Caucasus region, operates several mountain warfare units, most prominently the Cuban Cossack of Russia's Cuban region. NATO even devotes its own significant resources to alpine warfare at the NATO Mountain Warfare Center of Excellence in Slovenia. However, the intense training and resources that alpine warfare demands means that these forces are typically kept somewhat small, not including countries whose mountain warfare troops might be frequently sent to battle, like in India and Pakistan in the disputed Kashmir region. So as we conclude today's video then, it should be abundantly clear that the mountains are a double-edged sword, a lethal, nearly unstoppable adversary for those who are unprepared to confront them and a valuable asset to those who can tame them and use them to their advantage. With such an unchanging, even technology-resistant sphere of combat, it would be a mistake to predict any grand change anytime soon in the way that mountain warfare is fought. Instead, we'll predict just the opposite. That no matter how advanced warfare might become, the battles that take place in the high mountains will continue as they always have. They will be protracted, bitter affairs where many rules of combat must be rewritten or forgotten, and those who can ally themselves with the mountains are in a far better position to win the battles to come.